What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment and what I saw these young African Americans doing was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center. Well, hello. It is 
so good to be with you all this evening. I hope you are keeping safe and doing the same for those around you. My name is Novella Ford and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual stage for the Between the Lines series featuring Make Me Rain, the latest poetry collection by Nikki Giovanni. Ms. Giovanni will be joined in conversation by poet and activist Aja Monet. This is our last program of the year. So let me just say thank you for taking the time to learn, to grow, to escape, to soothe, and any other reason that brought you to our programs. Whether you tuned in live or watched at your own convenience, we are forever grateful that on any given day for 60 or 90 minutes, we could be in virtual community together. The Schomburg Center is celebrating 95 years as one of the world's leading cultural institutions devoted to research, preservation, and exhibition of materials focused on global Black experiences. Please consider a donation to support the Schomburg Center as we continue to provide ways to access our digital collections and create online public programs while our doors remain closed due to COVID-19. You can visit our website at schomburg.org where you can find how to buy books, where you can explore the collections, where you can view online exhibitions, maybe with some that you did not get a chance to see while we were open, um, as, as well as so much more. So I have to say for myself, Nikki Giovanni is hashtag goals. What I mean is she is a poet and an educator who loves growing older. And it's something that I hope that I will have many, 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 many years of doing in this life. She is someone who compliments young people and makes room for their leadership and voice. I find that admirable. Ms. Giovanni is a listener and her keen observations are well through in and throughout her poetry. Her language is tender. She can keep a secret. She also speaks truth to power. She has graced the Schomburg stage on many occasions to talk about her work and that of friends like Ellis Hazlett, the creator of the 1960s and 70s public television sensation Soul with an exclamation point at the end. And the internet could not get enough of the conversation that she had at the same show, Soul, when she was a 28-year-old force in the Black arts movement with 47-year-old acclaimed public intellectual essayist and author James Baldwin. If you have not seen that two-hour dialogue, I invite you to Google it and then enjoy the, sumptu the sumptuousness of their conversation. She has spent more than 50 years as a writer, as a successful writer, and I hope that you all are giving her virtual claps and cheers out there. She strikes me as a person who has always understood that they belong in whatever room they find themselves. Equally important, we have Aja Monet, whose poetry is also razor sharp and tender. She is described as a surrealist blues poet, storyteller, and organizer, born and raised in Brooklyn, currently living in South Florida. She won the legendary Nurekan Poets Cafe Grand Slam Poetry Award title in 2007, and Aja Monet follows in the long legacy and tradition of poets participating and assembling and assembling in social movements. Her first full collection of poems is titled My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter on Haymarket Books. To learn more about Aja, please visit her website at Aja Monet, that's A-J-A-M-O-N-E-T dot com. They are both poets who understand the power of the spoken word and the role that griots play in the community. Tonight, we get to delight in their conversation and readings from G Giovanni's latest collection. This is the conversation you didn't know that you were waiting for. Just a reminder, you can order Make Me Rain at the Schomburg Shop's website online at schombergshop.com. The Schomburg Shop is also a great place to pick up wonderful books and items by Black makers for any of the holidays you might be celebrating this season. We are recording this program for the archive, but you, the audience, will not be part of the recording. Uh, you can also rewatch this program on the Schomburg Center's YouTube channel, as well as livestream.com slash Schomburg Center. Please be mindful of your fellow audience members in the chat, and thank you again for tuning in. With that said, I turn it over to Aja Monet and beloved poet Nikki Giovanni. Did I come in? <laughs> We're here, I think. I think we're live. Machine taped me, and I was trying to figure out how to punch this. I'm probably the only person on earth that doesn't have a Facebook or tweet 
Is that what, I, I, I can't email, but I, I said, as soon as I retire from work, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm still teaching, which I love doing, but as soon as I retire, I'm going to learn how to, uh, what is that thing, email. And uh, I'll, I'll be, everybody will be very proud of me. I'll be sitting in the old folks' home and I'll finally have a computer and I'll be able to email. <laughs> Hi, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having, uh, for being here, being present and making time in consideration of the moment that we're in. We're in a virtual space, so I, I do understand. And to, to not have you worry so much, it's still difficult for me to understand, okay? So uh, we're all learning. Thank you. I that, want was, that was sweet of you. <laughs> um, I want to begin with a, a little kind of piece that I had written for um, there was Well-Read Black Girl Fest Festival had uh, done this tribute to you and we did a little conversation prior to it. And I wrote a little statement about the, the poem that I decided to share because everybody shared a poem that they loved of yours was um, a poem from the Love Poems, your collection, the Love, love Poems, and it was called Seduction. Um, and I will go into why you wrote that poem, but first I'm gonna read the little intro because it's gonna go into my question. Um, so for those of you who are joining, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, shout out to the Schomburg. We could not continue to, to do the work that we're doing in the world without knowing that a, the place like a Schomburg is there to hold our stories and to archive our experiences. So it is rare that we hear from the poetic radical imagination of black women on the front line, sitting in the living rooms of organizing meetings, cooking in the kitchen that fed the mouths of our revolutionaries, being the revolutionary leader who recipes our freedom in the bellies of our children and our loved ones. And as we radicalize ourselves into the world unseen, we neglect the sensitive touch of now. We have often existed in the forced lack of political imagination of white terrorism and its limitations on our complexity, on our sexuality and on our pleasure. What about the pleasure of our organizers and our revolutionaries? What is sex like with the radical imagination of black people? How have we lived out our loves, the day to day, the difficult, the mundane? What does the poet teach us of boredom reimagined, paying attention to the devil in details? When the pleasure is not enough, when the pain is so deep, how do we hold each other in the disagreement and the joy? Nikki Giovanni has recognized the militancy of our sex, our pleasure, our laughter, our difficulty, our disagreement of our relationships between one another. Many people believe that the black arts movement is some political aesthetic of the past, but it is the enduring commitment to our self-determination and our presence as well as our pleasure to encourage and to complicate the relationships between black people. Yes, not all of us be in the streets and some of us will never hold a gun in our hands, but is the, it is the concerted effort toward freedom, a collective unified vision and goal, the transformative decolonizing power of our gifts collectivized. The urgency of poetry is what liberates the psychic and emotional realities of our people. We follow in the legacy of Nikki Giovanni and her contemporaries, their spiritual fortitude and their dimensions of our death. Nikki Giovanni has examined and healed us in the doing of the poem as a site for our spine to tickle the lower back with a kiss and a hand leaning on the attitude of our hips, the pride of being black and woman and revolutionary to the complication of our brothers and the patriarchy they've inherited from the white mythology making. Her poems show us where we need to grow, where we need to involve and listen. And most importantly, that black women are deserving of comfort, of softness, of laying in the lofty liberation of love. What revolution is worth anything without our strategy and tactics towards our pleasure? We need to organize our imaginations and to heal the hurt. Her poetry guides us through this. The medicine of our black women and men healing together will revolutionize our communities and cause the greatest uprising this country will ever see. Thank you, Nikki Giovanni, for writing through the pain and the pleasure for writing at all. We thank you. Wow, thank you. That that's lovely. <laughs> that's humbling. <laughs> you know, I had to give you your flowers while you're still here. So, oh, well, thank you. Uh, I've I've often said uh, just because it's been so much unhappiness lately, and so many people have died, 
and my students and I were talking about that. And some people were saying, well, you shouldn't be wasting your money sending flowers to, you know, dead people. And I said, listen, when I die, I want every damn one of my flowers. I want my casket covered. I want the room. Don't, don't hand me that, you know, send it to this charity or that charity. Hell with that charity. If they didn't get it when I was alive, they can't have it. I want my flowers. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm giving you all your flowers and I'm so honored to be here for you. So I want to ask, because I have a, a few questions and I want to give, give you space to answer them because I also want you to read from this beautiful collection. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you've been asked it already, a vi a vi a, since you're not on the internet, you might not know, a video of yours went viral and it was the video, which viral means that it just was all over, everybody was sharing it. And it was a video of you and um, brother James Baldwin having a conversation on the television show, on Soul television show. And it would appear from that conversation with Baldwin so many years ago that not much has changed between in terms of the hurt and harm and miscommunication between black men and women. Um, I wanted to ask you, because in an article that, that, you, that recently came out about your book, you said, uh, everybody needs a bench. And in order to get a bench, you need to be one. Um, I could say love, but you get tired of, of, of hearing about love. But I wanted to ask you, what has given you hope and what do you hope to see that is yet to be expressed between us, between black women and black men that that um that inspires you yeah well the first bench has to be yourself as you know that's a tony morrison you know tony morrison said that uh that she was talking about beloved her her book tony is a, a good friend and I, I miss her so much and she said you know there's nothing to to commemorate slavery in america not even a bench when she said that there wasn't a bench and as i thought about that i said yeah there should be a bench not about slavery, but a bench about you and me. There should be a bench about who we are to each other, who a person is to a person. Because love, you know, when you're young, when you're, you're, you're you know, as you, when you're your, your age, love is really about sex. And so and, and if it's good, you know, you're lucky. And if it's bad, you get rid of it. But <laughs> when you get to be my age, love is about that bench, somebody who's got your back, somebody that you can depend on and who can depend upon you. And that's what I wanted to, to remind us as, as, as sisters, we, we, we need to be each other's bench. And you have to be careful because everybody will not be a bench. You will go to sit down and somebody will snatch it and you'll find yourself on the ground. But that's for true. the most part, but yeah, for the most part, what you should do is just look over your shoulder. That's why you've got one. You got two actually, but look over one of them and say, is the bench there? And don't, don't make a mistake in thinking something's there that's not. And if it's there, then you can sit. Then you know, I'm safe with that. And it's, uh, I saw the, the picture, of, of course, I looked at the uh, opening of this. And I saw, of course, uh, and they're gone, Maya, who was a good friend, uh, dancing with, with Baraka. And you think, oh, my, those, those were, I'm, I remember when that happened. It was, those were great days. And then I saw Jimmy with, uh, with, with, with Tony. And again, you had two brilliant people standing there together, sharing. And, uh, you know, you just hope. And, and Jimmy was 20 years older than I was when we did that, uh, when we did the Soul Show. We did it in London because Jimmy said, oh, I'd love to talk to Nikki, but I don't have time to come to the United States. Would she mind? <laughs> Could you believe that? He, would she mind coming to London? He said, you got to be kidding. I would, I would swim to London to talk to Jimmy Baldwin. And you know, you, you begin to see now I'm probably a little more than 20 years older th than you. And at some point, you're going to be 20 years older than someone. And we might say, well, has anything changed? Well, one of the things that's changed is that we recognize these 20 years between the bump, the bump, the bump, we have built a sisterhood and we have built a community and everybody has a bench. We might not all have a whole bunch, but we have one and we recognize it. And that's, that's what's important, recognizing this is my bench, this is who I lean on, and this is who leans on me, and I'm not going to let anybody take that away from me, because people try to do that. And mm. I'm, I'm looking on the other side of you, speaking of your shoulder, and I'm seeing like a ripple on a pond. And, uh, <laughs> that's it. and I will say to everybody, because they may not know it, this is something that would be helpful. If you get a Grammy Award, go 
because the Grammys have the best food. If you get a, <laughs> they do. If you get an Oscar award, you don't have to go because the Oscars are all involved in being thin. And so you go to an Oscar award, you don't get any good food. You know, they're all into your health. But the Grammy awards, you know, everybody's fat and everybody's eating, you know, and I would go, be sure that you go to the Grammy awards. <laughs> Um, wow. Okay. So my, my next question for you is in our movements and in our um, community spaces, a lot of women are grappling with what does transformative justice look like, restorative justice in terms of how to respond to alternative methods of dealing with, um, the criminal justice system or injustice system. We don't, we don't want to put more people in prison, right? And we want abolition. So this is the moment of abolition. And I wanted to ask from the lessons you learned being in movement as well as being a poet, how did we, how did you deal with harm in the community? When someone committed harm, what were ways that we were able to, um, that you saw that were either positive or challenging around trying to, trying to rectify or reckon with harm, uh, whether it be against a, another brother or a sister um, how do we deal with that, that harm within each other? I asked uh, Baldwin when, when Jimmy and I were talking and we, we, we started, I said, tell me about lies. Because when men go out to work every morning, they lie to white men because they don't like the white men, the white men don't like them. They come home and they abuse, in some cases, their wives. They hit their wives or they holler at their wives or they do something. And I said, I don't understand why you've made a decision to lie and smile at a white guy and frown at me. If you're going to tell a lie, make the lie come home and smile at me when you come home. If that's a lie, if that's not how you feel, if you had a bad day, don't, don't let me see that. By the time you walk through that door, smile and be glad to see me. And you know who was a great guy? And we don't, we don't deal with him nearly enough, was uh, Pappy. Uh, uh, the, the, the husband of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Pappy Hamer. And he was just a great guy, you know, and he, he just, who knows how he felt because he got up early in the morning and went out and sharecropped and didn't make any money, but he stood by his wife. And we need to, and I don't think that all men do that. I, I think that women are expecting, I think you look at too many movies. I think that, that you heard too many songs and you think, oh, that's what it should be. Love is about a lot of work. You put a lot of work into it. And one of the things that black women have done is that we have, from since we were brought here to America, we have gotten up to make a home. And when our children were stolen from us, they were taken from us, when we were st stolen from our, our husbands, or our friends, whatever we want to call them, we had to make another home. And we, we managed to do that no matter what it took, we managed to find a way to, to, to create that smile, to create that, I love you. And as hard as it must be, I wrote a poem in here and I was asking in, in, in the poem, I said, how did, nobody ever asked, but how did Mary feel? Because she stood there, she was the one, she and, and the beloved disciple, John, because everybody's upset about John, but John was the beloved disciple. That's what Jesus called him. It's good enough for me. John and, and Mary were the only two people who stood there at the cross. And when Jesus stopped that hum, because you know he had to be humming or singing or doing something to, to pass the time until he passed, until he transitioned. And it was Mary and John who cut him down, cleaned him up, and buried him. And we have to ask ourselves, well, who, who, what, what is love? That's love. And as you recall, Jesus asked John, take care of my mother, because he knew that the rest of those people weren't any good. He, he knew that, that Judas was going to deceive him. He knew that Simon was going to deny him. He asked John, take care of my mother. And I think sometimes we have to think about that too. We have to think about take care of each other. Uh, there's a poem. There's a poem, of course, it's one, thank you for that response. There's a poem in your book, Make Me Rain, which is, I love the title. Um, that's about Entezaki Shange, which uh, I thought was so powerful because you have this quote in an interview that you did where you said, I thought 50 years ago that I could make a big difference in the world. What I know now is that I will not allow the world to make a big difference in me. I'm not going to let the fact that uh, what is it like an, in a nation with a bunch of fools? I'm not going to let them make a fool out of me, basically. 
Um, and I thought that that was such a powerful statement because in 2018, I was, I was a part of a facilitating a co collective called Poetry for the People. And we did a Maroon Poetry Festival and we were actually trying to get you, but now I know you don't look at your email, so we weren't <laughs> able to get you. But um, we organized this freedom dream of, of a small grassroots poetry festival. And we brought the last poets to Liberty City, uh, Miami. We brought Entezaki Shange, we brought Emery Douglas and Krista Cobb. And, it was the one moment that Entezaki, I think it was the only moment I know before, right before she passed, that she was able to be, to sit right in front of, you know, the brothers who used to critique her pieces and say all this stuff about how she was making black people, black men look and, and all these things. Um, and I wanted to ask you in all the years that you've been a part of the black arts movement and seen the, the ranges of, of the little in, in disagreements and the, and the, um, and the growth and the maturity um, what is the biggest lesson you've learned looking back, reflecting now that you've lived long enough to look back about the Black arts movement and the, the power of um, the convictions you all had and the poetry and the art that you were making together? Oh, well, first of all, Paulette was a wonderful girl. And I remember when, when, when she first did uh, 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 the, the sister. Color. Yeah, and it was wonderful. And so we were all very uh, supportive, but we were also supportive of August Wilson. And as, as far as somebody like me, as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to be supportive of anything that's good. And of course, one of the most brilliant people living right now, writers, is, is uh, excuse me, is uh, Edwidge Danica. And, uh, oh yeah, she, she's just wonderful. But one of the most, oh good, yeah, she, she's a great kid. Just, um, she's, she's not a kid, but she's a great woman. But one of the uh, also great YA writers is Renee Watson. And of course, one of the most brilliant and hardest working young men is Kwame Alexander. So what I try to do is keep, as the old song says, keep your eye on the prize. You just can't keep worrying about who's a fool. Because if you keep your mind on the fool, you're not going to get anything done. It's why I'm glad I don't know Facebook and Twitter and all of that stuff, because you can't get anything done. You're sitting there listening to somebody lie to you about how lovely their life is. You can't get anything done. And so I just try to deal with the people that I like. And I know, by the way, no matter what people said, and we've had, not you and I, but there's been this conversation because they say, Nikki, you've been mean. But, you know, you have a right to hate people. Like, I hate Donald Trump. And I'm, I'm glad he's gone. And if tomorrow morning I picked up the paper and he had dropped dead, nothing would make me happier. I have a right to, somebody said, well, you can't hope that he's dead. Why not? He hopes that I am. He hopes that people like me are. And I also know who I love. And I think it's, an, it's, it's important to, for me to be able to say to the young women and the young men, uh, Jericho Brown, and, and I just love Jericho. He's so sweet. I was so proud when Jericho won the, the uh, Pulitzer. Now, the Pulitzer didn't say that Jericho is a good writer because Jericho was a great writer, whether the Pulitzer yeah. recognized it or not. But yeah. I was so, so pleased because I've known Jericho for, for the longest. Kwame Dawes is one of the most brilliant young poets, just period. I mean, his work is just incredible. If I can't find my way into embracing that and being proud that I am a part of that, then I'm gonna end up liking some other crap. I'm gonna end up thinking Bill Barr, William Barr has good sense. I'm, you know, you, you have to make up your mind. Who makes sense? Who do you love? Who are you proud of? I'm proud of you kids, you youngsters. And I say that because I am, I'm getting to be, I am an old lady. And I recommend old age, by the way. So anybody who's listening to us is, that's being worried, oh, I don't want, yeah, you do want to grow old because there's nothing on earth harder than the teenage years. I'm sure you remember that. There's just nothing on, I mean, it's a punishment. God just fixes you. So you're going to be between 12 and 18 and, and you will be so sorry because once you can get by that, you can have good sense. You can begin to, to make some sense out of your life. But once you get past 50, you can, every night you can come home and pour yourself a glass of champagne. So you can't do that now because you got kid, not you. I don't know anything about you, Asha. But, you know, you have things to do when you come home. And I found out recently, I was talking to my son and he said, well, you know, I used to know. He said, I would hear you writing at, I knew when it was 11 o'clock at night because I could hear, I had an old typewriter during those days. Yeah, I could hear you. And I said, I never knew you heard me write. And he said, I heard you. I knew it was 11 because I heard the typewriter. And I thought that was, wow. that was something. But see, now I'm an old lady. So at 11, I can tell you exactly what I'm doing. I'm looking at the weather. 
because they say today it's going to rain or whatever it's going to do is a goodie. And I'm pouring myself a glass of champagne because I'm an old lady and I've done my job. And so exactly. one of the nice things, oh yeah. It, one of the nice things about going to that next stage is that next, that next job. I don't know what that next job will be. I'm a writer. All I have are words and I like words and I dislike people misusing words, but Words are wonderful, and, and I watch you kids, I watch you youngsters, and, and what you're doing out there, it's, it's wonderful. I'm so proud of Black Lives Matter and what they have created, and that has gone all over the, the globe. I'm, I'm just, I'm proud of what, what the young Black people are doing. And I don't know that I have a right to be proud like that. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I have a right, but I am. When I read about you and I, I keep up with I keep and I'm thinking, yeah, look, look at what the kids are doing. We've done what we can do to open up that door. And I guess if need be, we would still come to try. But we're not we're not here. And I'm saying we people, I'm 77. We are not here to tell you what to do. We're here now to support you in what you think you should do. Hmm. I I really appreciate that. I wanted to ask you. There's a part in your piece uh, in, in, on page 57 in Make Me Rain where it says, we write because we have evolved to another century. We write to be sure the words to the songs and for those who understand the notes to the music get written down. We write because we are lonely and scared and we need to keep our hearts open. And I wanted to ask you, do you ever feel like you're writing the same poem over and over again? Um, and do, do, yeah, I wanted to know, do you ever feel like you're writing the same poem? No, I, I don't. And it's because I'm not afraid of making a mistake. And I say that to my students. And I would say that if, I, if this were a workshop, I would say, don't be afraid of making a mistake. And once you are not afraid of making a mistake, then you can let what you have learned about yourself or about the world go. And you will take another, you will take another step forward. I seldom, seldom, seldom read the same poems because I'm always into what is now called the new book. And I'm really so pleased with uh, Make Me Rain. I, I think it's wonderful. But Make Me Rain is a thank you. It's a shout out, you know, the, the cover is a shout out to Marvin Gaye because of uh, what's going on. If you remember the, the cover, well, you don't remember, you're probably too young, but the cover of what's going on is the rain coming down. And Marvin is kind of just, he's got his shoulders a little hunched, but the rain is coming down and we know that there is no life without without water. You have to have the rain. And so the first poem in my book is a love poem. And again, it's going to be it's going to be rain because the rain is what we is is what we cuddle with. The rain is what we listen to. The rain is what lulls us to sleep. And and you know we have to you know people complain oh it's rain and I can't do anything. But where would you be without rain? You have to have rain. <laughs> yeah, for things to grow. I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, I looked, I've been doing a lot of research on, you know, workshops and the role of workshops. There's a book um, by Mark Nowak called Social Poetics, and he goes into the history of workshop and kind of the political um, importance of workshops and why they were, were so crucial to movements. And I wanted to ask what workshops or collectives were integral in shaping your relationship to poetry? I know that there was like Obasi and Watts, Prophet, and um, uh, the, the Watts poets, uh, poetry for the people we collectively created, many beautiful zines and events and workshop spaces, but we didn't document them well. And so I wanted to ask if there was any collective workshop you were a part of that you wish more people were aware of or um, outside of the academic space, like how crucial do you think workshops are in the black community? Because I feel like that was such a big part as well as the organizing meetings for poetry. Oh, sorry, see, I fell. I think that uh, workshops can be over uh, stressed because people think, oh, I have to learn how to make the workshop people happy with what I'm doing. And a workshop is only as, as good as sitting around talking to somebody. And I'm a sense, I was a, a Knoxvillean by birth. I grew up in Cincinnati. And of course, everything that was happening in, in, in the, the uh, Black Arts Movement is going to happen, which I, I attended Columbia University. It's going to happen in New York. But of course, and, and this, I, I, I can, cannot overstress, Detroit had the, mu at that point, Detroit had the music. And so we, and I say all of us who were writing, spent an incredible amount of time in Detroit. I don't know that we knew that we were actually learning from the music, but 
going there with that that level of this is what this is what the songs are saying. Look at Stevie Wonder, the, one of the best uh, songwriters, period, in America is Stevie Wonder. When we when we look at his his uh, book, at, at at his his songbook, at what he's done. But one of the we're back to Marvin. One of the most brilliant songwriters is Marvin Gaye. And wouldn't you just love to see what's going on as an opera on stage? Wouldn't you just love to see that as a ballet? Wouldn't you just love to see that taking the next step? And uh, Patti LaBelle, there's a new book out uh, by Patti LaBelle, about Patti LaBelle, about LaBelle. And of course, LaBelle is a part of the uh, Philadelphia group. And LaBelle had a lot to do with changing, you know how the girl groups would all look just dressed up and really nice and, oh, we're just really looking for a boyfriend. And then it was LaBelle that came out with, which was so wonderful, Lady Mama Line, voulez-vous coucher avec moi? <laughs> That's what, and everybody's like, oh my God, did you know she was, it was wonderful. And that changed how the girl groups, if I can use that term, singing, how they changed, how they looked at it. They weren't looking at it like, oh, I don't know, if I could just find a boyfriend, they're saying like, no, do you want to go to bed or you don't? And it was, <laughs> it was so, La Bella is so wonderful. And I saw that that uh, we had Marcus Samuelson uh, mentioned, he was at, at the beginning here. And Marcus is the uh, guest editor of um, Bon Appetit this, this, uh, this uh, December. And it's so, again, it's so wonderful. And I was so pleased. Marcus invited me to be, uh, to write a poem for him. And uh, I was I was thrilled because one I, I I love his restaurants but I just Bon Appetit has never done a, a a poem before and I thought there's nothing that should be in a in a a, a a food book as much as a poem should be and Don Davis is now the new editor and I'm sure that Don recognized that food and poetry go together and so what what you what the blacks are trying to do, what the black people are trying to what we are trying to do is bringing things together that should be together. You asked me about a workshop, but there's no better workshop than just being at, at and, and just sitting for a day in the Schomburg. Look at what you'll see, look at the people you'll see and what you will see about them. And as Toni Morrison would say, and, and as, as I say again, we miss her so much, but if, if Toni were here, she would say, look at their shoes because you know so much about people by the shoes they wear. And she's right, Tony's right about that. I mean, just, just so right about that. And, and you can imagine, you, there's so much to be learned. So you ask about a workshop, what's a workshop? The workshop is what you make it. Mm. You can sit on 125th and, and 7th Avenue and that's a workshop if you're paying attention. Yeah, paying attention seems to be the thing. I wanted to ask you two more questions before we have you read. Oh. <laughs> We have, so we're in a pandemic, we're in a moment of global pandemic and we can't, that can't be lost on us. There's a interview I saw you do where you talked about how our imagination has to evolve and what does our imagination have to, to do with um, how, like how we don't destroy, but how we live with things. I think specifically you were talking about fighting cancer um, that, and you said you don't fight with, fight cancer, you live with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't, we need to do that on any number of bacteria or viruses um, not how do we destroy, because if we think we can destroy it, we're wrong, but how do we live with it? That's what the poets are supposed to be able to tell us. So I wanted to ask you, how do we live with this moment uh, in the middle of a global pandemic? What have you learned in the middle of this pandemic about where we're going and what you see our, our country um, reflecting on when it's having to take a seat, being forced, everybody's being forced to pay attention? Well, I think it's really nice that people have to stay home. Of course, it takes up a lot of your time because people are now emailing you and, and writing you, not just me, but a lot of people because they have more time because they're home all the time as opposed to being out. I think that's good. I think that without, without uh, and, and I sin I'm sincere about this, without uh, uh, the virus, I don't think that, that we would have been able to elect um, uh, Kamala Harris as our vice president. I think that too many other things would have happened. But when we looked at Donald Trump and the evil, crazy son of a bitch that he is, and we looked at that evil fool who was the vice president, the black community, and particularly you ask about black men, but the black men came out. They came out and they did their job. They voted and they voted for a woman because the black men did not vote for, for Hillary. 
if, if you go back. They, I don't think that they wanted a woman, but they came out and they said, oh, we, we got to get Kamala. And, and I think that that's, that's good. The divine nine, I don't know if you went to school, I'm a Delta. The divine nine came out and I was so proud of them because it was none of that who's here, who's looking at, none of that. It was that we are together and we have to, we have to stay together. We have to, we have to see what we can do. So I've been very, um, I'm, I'm very proud of, of us. We have gone through more than this pandemic that we're going through, uh, not just us, but the world. And I have my kids um, looking at, uh, and you've heard, everybody's heard it, Little Red Riding Hood, because everybody thinks that this is some sort of a, oh, isn't that a joke? But what happened in Detroit, in, in, in Michigan, with the governor of Michigan, with the Wolverines, right, were stalking the governor and were gonna murder her. And then you think, okay, now we're looking, I had my class look at that. Now we're looking at Little Red Riding Hood. Okay, we know that in order to, that, that the people who had the red on had scarlet fever, had, had, had red fever, and people wouldn't touch them, wouldn't go near them. So we're thinking, okay, Little Red Riding Hood's mother sent her to her grandmother. And we know that every time you have a problem, who do you have to go to or who do you go to if you, if you can? You go to your grandmother. And so we now have her going through the woods and they're saying, oh, the wolves are gonna get her, but the wolves are not gonna get her because she is obviously ill. Obviously she has, or her mother is making it look like that. And it's been really interesting to have my students begin to look at the old uh, uh, folk tales because they're not just, oh, isn't that sweet and isn't that cute? There, there are some other things, um, some other things going, going on. And I've been, I really have been interested in and a lot of that, that, that'd be too long. We don't have enough days to go through yeah. all of them. But I know, it's, I know you know, um, we have, we have a, we want to get you to, to read your, your poems from Make Me Rain so everybody can go buy and support this book, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when, before I read this, the last question, and then you can go into just reading after, um, there's a book by Robin D.G. Kelly, who's someone I love and look up to a, men a mentor. And he has this quote in the book called Freedom Dreams, and it's about the black radical imagination. And he says, now is the time to think like poets to envision and make visible a new society, a peaceful, cooperative, loving world without poverty and oppres oppression limited only by our imaginations. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Sister Nikki Giovanni, what is your freedom dream? What is the vision that you hope to see, whether you see it in the flesh or in spirit? I, I, I really think it is more going to be in spirit. It's not ever going to be all right. It's just, as I say to my students and, and I would, my son and to my granddaughter, anybody else, you just don't, you're not going to change the world. I mean, that's one of the things I've learned. You could make it a little better, but you're not going to change the world. You just have to make sure that the world doesn't change you. And when we look at Nazis like Donald Trump, you look, you, you cannot be a part of that. You have to say to yourself, I don't want to be like Donald Trump. I don't want to be like Hitler. I don't want to be those evil people. And that'll give us a better world. But it's, it's never going to be like, oh, isn't everything OK? Because everything is not going to be OK. We're just going to go one step at a time. That's, that's all we're going to do. And I, I don't smoke because I have cancer. I know, <laughs> But now I'm living in a state that has just passed a, a, a law that says marijuana is OK. <laughs> I remember they used to arrest people for marijuana and some other things. Remember? No, you may not. But other things are going to come up. And it, it's, it's just a question of how we look at what we have and how we deal with what we deal with. It's never going to be, oh, isn't that wonderful? It's just going to be a little better and a little fairer. And I think that's I think that's good enough. Thank you so much, Nikki Giovanni. You are such an inspiration and I'm so grateful that you're still writing and creating in the world. Please do us the honor of reading some of your poems from Make Me Rain. Oh, I'd love to start with the first poem, Make Me Rain. Make me rain, turn me into a snowflake. Let me rest on your tongue. Make me a piece of ice so I can cool you. Let me be the cloud that embraces you or the quilt that keeps you dry, snuggle close. Listen to me sing on the windowsill. Make me rain on you. And I love that, uh, just the whole idea of it. I have a, I have a granddaughter and she's a, she's a really sweet kid. And I wrote this poem for her. 
When you grow up, remember, I'm a train, diesel with wings. I can take you anywhere. I'm a book. You can learn everything. I'm fried chicken. You will never be hungry. I'm a quilt to keep you warm. I'll be with the ancestors, so you'll have to tweet from your heart. But I'll know who is calling, since I only have one granddaughter. And I think that's so funny because people want to. People will will email you now, or or what is it? Yeah, that's email. Uh, uh, and 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 they they don't tell you who they are, and it's like you know you're supposed to know. And so when when she calls me, she'll say, "Grandma Nick, this is Kai." Well, I know who she is because when I hear well, first of all, I know her voice, but when I hear Grandma Nick, I know who she is because I only have one granddaughter. And so I love that poem, and I wrote it for her. Some call it speaking of love. We we're talking about love. Some call it love. I am a flower. You can put me in your window. I don't need soil, seed soil, only a bit of water, some sunshine, and every now and then a kiss. I may not grow, but I'll stick around and wave to you each morning. And I think that's the easiest thing to forget that uh, you don't have to have a whole lot. And I live in what I'm calling uh, practically a jungle because I have, my mother died uh, 13 years ago and some of the flowers uh, that were uh, on her grave, speaking of all of that, um, some of them had had uh, vines, and I brought the vines home. So it's been 13 years, but they grew, and I continued to have it. My son and and his office had a vine that uh, his 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 uh, friend, his girlfriend had given him, and I said, "Oh, Thomas, you know, please send me a piece of it. I'd love to have it and have it with mommies." And he said, "Oh, okay." So he finally he FedExed it to me, and I have that growing. And now because it's cold, I brought the rosemary. I have a rosemary bush in so that, that I can have fresh rosemary. And I will uh, close because I don't want to hold everybody up. I will close on the blues because the blues are so important. Some folks think the blues is a song or a way of singing, but the blues is history, a way of telling how we got here and who sent us. The blues may talk about my man or my woman who left me or took my money and is gone. But what they mean is I was stolen in an African war and ignorantly sold, probably not realized into a new world, but the Lord is good and gave us a song to tell our story. We sang the blues in the cotton fields, not to complain about our lives, but to let each other know we are still here. We stir the, beat, the blues in our stews to give us the strength to go on. And Lord have mercy, we use the blues to give us joy, to make us laugh, to teach us how to love and dance and run away and much more, thank the Lord, how to stay until the next day. The blues is our history, our quilt, the way we fry our chickens, the way we boil our greens to make something really good, something to drink, the blues, is our encyclopedia. And no matter who tries to copy us, only we know the real meaning of those songs. So I want to thank you. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Everybody go get Make Me Rain and start making it rain. <laughs> Thanks, Asia. <laughs> yes, everyone, go make it rain for Nikki Giovanni. Thank you so much, Aja, for really a skillful facilitation of this conversation. Thank you, Nikki Giovanni, for always being so honest and giving uh, with your audience, with your fans, um, with those who are beloved to call you mentor and teacher and and sister in their head and aunt in their head and 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 you know just person that they look up to and look forward to hearing your wisdom i wish i was in my physical home with all my books your books um so that i can pull out the perfect poem to mention but i will say when i first picked up um make me rain uh, i happened to fall on the page uh with novella at the top of it and i thought for one, and then I remembered, of course, Novella Nelson, but it was a sign that it was a book that I should read. So I highly recommend everyone to pick up 
um, a copy of this book. And if you don't have enough Nikki Giovanni in your life, please look back into the catalog and find something that you love. She also mentioned really great writers today. Um, and I hope that you all will consider Renee Watson, who is a beautiful children's book writer and, and poet, um, and I believe has a new book coming out, I wanna say next year, if it didn't just come out this year, Kwame Alexander, of course, Jericho Brown, um, who we recently featured at the Schomburg Center as part of um, the latest collection, 250 Years of African American Poetry that was edited by our outgoing uh, director, Kevin Young. Uh, and she also mentioned who, oh, Edward, Edward Dundekat, of course, just by all of that. Um, and of course, our amazing facilitator, please visit Aja Monet's website uh, to learn more about her current work as well as work that she has coming out. Again, I will say everyone, please um, take care of yourselves and also take care of those around you and take care of a stranger if you can. Um, be safe, enjoy this holiday season. Uh, the fight is not over. Let's refresh, let's rest, and let's keep, um, let's keep at the business at hand. Take care. <laughs>